Hello there everybody and thank you for taking the time to watch this short video. Um, I often get asked who is my favourite historical figure and I think a lot of people expect that answer to be Henry VII. But the truth be told, the, the person who I've enjoyed studying the most has been a chap called Thomas Beaufort. And I'd like to just take a couple of uh, minutes, maybe a bit more, to just discuss the life and career of Thomas and hopefully you will understand a little bit more why I think he at least is an underappreciated figure in English uh, royal history. Thomas was born around 1377 and I do make the argument uh, in my book The House of Beaufort that it's likely the Beauforts were born in rural Lincolnshire or perhaps more specifically at the home of their mother Catherine Swinford, and that is at Kettlethorpe Manor. Uh, the Beaufort family were the illegitimate children of Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt, and I think that's quite a well-known um, story that most people will at least have the, the, the basic knowledge of. Uh, Thomas's childhood uh, is not really well remarked upon, and that's not surprising, because he was the youngest child of an illegitimate um, you know, group of children, but he was legitimised in 1396 and 1397 as a result of his parents' marriage. So John of God and Catherine Swinford did eventually marry when Thomas Beaufort was in his late teens, and that was something that enabled him to really kick on with his career. Um, the, the first, the first year of Thomas really. Uh, striking out on his own is in 1402 when he was made um, captain of Ludlow Castle in the Welsh Marches and the idea really was for him to, to learn ha learn warfare uh, by fighting the you know the troublesome Welsh and it's really interesting because one of the people who was there under his command was the teenage uh, Prince Henry the future Henry V where he got his first taste of warfare as well so you've got these two two men uncle and nephew though they were only nine years apart in age bonding together at an early age learning the art of war and that's something that would play a part later in thomas Beaufort's life that connection with his uncle um over the next 10 years thomas really started to kick on in the military world uh, specifically at sea, because he was made uh, Admiral of the Fleet in the North and the West, with his remit later extended to cover um, Aquitaine, Picardy and Ireland, all then under the control of the English King. Uh, we know, in fact, that Thomas was created the first ever Lord High Admiral, which was a position created specifically for him in 1410. And it is a position that still exists today although i think the current holder is actually uh prince philip who at about 97 98 years old i'm not quite sure how active he is out on the seas um a really interesting moment in thomas Beaufort's life happened in 1410 when as a result of factional conflict at the court which you know certainly not a, a new concept then thomas was actually briefly appointed the chancellor now, this is an interesting appointment because the Chancellor traditionally was a member of the church. The reason being that to be a Chancellor, you had to know how to read and write to keep up with the demands of the role. So you had to be a learned man. Now, Thomas, when he was appointed, was the first non-churchman uh, in about 35 years appointed to the role. And he was the first man without uh, any form of noble title to be appointed for nearly 40 years. So it's a very interesting appointment of Thomas's in 1410. And it does suggest that at that point, he was already re recognised as a man above his peers. I mean, he certainly must have been able to read and write, for example. You know, this, this was clearly um, a man on the make, you, you know, a, a clever man, an erudite man, somebody able to stand up and speak at Parliament, for example. But the truth is, even though he did briefly fill that reign, it was as a soldier that Thomas was most comfortable. 
And in the summer of 1412, the king, Henry IV, uh, decided to launch an invasion of France. And one of the men that he chose to lead this invasion of France was his half-brother, Thomas Beaufort. Uh, of course, you couldn't send an untitled commander over to fight the mighty French. You know, that wouldn't look very good um, on the English part. So Thomas was actually at this point created an earl. Uh, he was named by his half-brother, Henry IV, to be the Earl of Dorset. Now, that 1412 uh, invasion of France um, didn't really kick in. It, it was really more of a, of, a, of a raid once they landed in France. But the following year, Henry V died, and that brought about the accession of Henry V. Uh, Thomas Beaufort's nephew. Now, Henry V, as everybody who knows uh, even the most basic parts of history, was a king destined to to be involved in warfare. Um, and that brought Thomas Beaufort great opportunity to really make a name for himself. So in, uh, in 1415, when a vast English army departed Southampton for France, for Henry V to try and conquer the Kingdom of France. At the forefront of this campaign was Thomas Beaufort. Uh, and by this point, he was in his mid-30s. And I hope, speaking of somebody in their mid-30s, in the prime of his life. Um, the first point of attack for the English was the coastal town of Harfleur. And the English, you know, after laying a, a siege against the town... They, they, took, they took it, they conquered it. Now, Henry V at this point wanted to go back to England for the winter, um, or at least to try and get back to Calais. So when he left, he put Thomas Beaufort in charge of Harfleur. And the remit was very simple. Thomas had to keep this town of Harfleur, no questions asked, throughout the winter, so that Henry V could come back and restart his invasion again from this coastal town, you know, to set her up as a base for the English operation. So Henry V did go back um, towards England. Uh, on the way, he did get caught up in a, a little battle known as Argenco. Um, but Thomas held out at Harfleur, and it was a very difficult task because the French kept on coming in wave after wave after wave to try and retake this town. And Thomas had to stay and try and fend off those attacks. Now, we do know that he complained to London quite a bit during this time, claiming that they were underfunding him. I mean, who hasn't heard of London underfunding the provinces? But Thomas did manage to hold out, um, perhaps even against the odds. He managed to keep Harfleur. And there was one interesting episode when, you know, he had no money. His town was running out of food. So he left the town of Harfleur to go on a raid into French territory. But what happened was he came across not one, but two French armies. And he managed to fight his way through those French forces to get back to the safety of Harfleur. You know, this mission was a disaster. He's very lucky he came through it with his life intact um, and he certainly lost some English soldiers in the process but what's quite amusing is that back in England this was painted as a great victory of Thomas Beaufort not you know a misjudged raid desperately for food and one chronicle Adam of Usk even noted that Thomas Beaufort apparently slew 200 Frenchmen alone and that's what we call fake news 15th century style but even though this raid of Thomas's was you know it was a failure in England as he was painted as a hero he was actually elevated by parliament to the dukedom um, he was created a duke of Exeter and the reason that was given for this creation was um, due to his service to his king and the realm on both sides of the sea. So Thomas Beaufort was being recognised as a man who really was taking the fight to the French on behalf 
of his king. And what's incredible about this is that at the time Thomas Beaufort was created a duke, there were only three dukes in the entire country at the time. And they were the dukes um, of Clarence, of Bedford and of Gloucester. And those three dukes were all the brothers of the king. So Thomas Beaufort was the only duke in England at the time who was not a brother of the king. And that certainly must say something about, um, you know, his ability and how highly thought of he was at the time. Now, fast forward a little bit to the summer of 1418 and Henry V was back in France and the target was the city of Rouen. And that was the second largest city in France at the time and was a vital fortress that Henry V needed to conquer. Now, the siege of, of, of Rouen took five to six months to accomplish. It was a horrendous situation for everybody involved. You know, um, the, the people of the town, they held out stubbornly for that time. Uh, but by the end of those six months, if they hadn't died of starvation, then the only people, <coughs> excuse me, the only people who were still uh, still alive at the time were forced to live off the flesh of dogs, uh, cats, mice, rats and their horses. It, it was a desperate time and at one point the, um, the, the townspeople even kicked out the women and children from the town hoping that they could be pushed on to the English army where Henry V would simply keep them prisoner. He didn't do that. He let them die he let them starve in front of his watching soldiers on one side and the watching townsfolk on the other side you know he was a hard king and he really wanted this town uh, when the town did surrender uh, in january 1419 the town surrendered into the hands of thomas beaufort it was he as henry v's commander who marched into the town to accept their submission and one can only wonder what must have greeted him when he got inside that town i mean there must have been dead lying in the streets everywhere um you know i think one one poet who was there at the time called john page noted that if the people weren't dropping dead where they stood they were just but skin and bones you know this must have been a horrendous um situation for thomas Beaufort to be in but nevertheless the english captured that town and it was thomas who was made the captain of rouen by his nephew so the two main towns that the english had captured were both handed over to thomas to keep for the english against the french um now once henry v had captured um captured rouen you know, his French war was going the way that he wanted. And that led to a momentous treaty in 1420, uh, in May 1420, uh, known as the Treaty of Troyes. And what this treaty um, in effect promised was that Henry V would marry the French princess Catherine de Valois. And when her father, the French King Charles, died, Henry V would become King of France. And it was this that was exactly the reason that a man like Thomas Beaufort had given his blood, sweat and tears for five years to bring about his nephew becoming king, not only king of England, but also king of France. Um, in the meantime, because Henry V was given control of the French king, Charles, that man was put over to the custody of Thomas Beaufort. So once again, for the third time, we've seen Henry V entrust his uncle with a very important task. He had given him Harfleur, he had given him Rouen, and now he'd given him control of the French king. You know, he really trusted his uncle to do what was needed in his best interests. But, as anyone who knows um, the story of Henry V, he did not live to become King of France, for he died in 1422. And he made one 
last decision um, that involved Thomas Beaufort at this time. When he looks through his entire nobility to decide who should be the man who should be entrusted with the day-to-day -day upbringing of his nine-month-old heir, the most precious baby in all of Europe at that time, the man that he turned to was Thomas Beaufort. So what does this say, again, about Thomas Beaufort's uh, character? Just think about this. Henry V had chosen him specifically to raise his heir. Um, you know, they had been together figuratively and literally for most of their lives. As I mentioned at the start, Thomas and Henry V had been together at Ludlow. They knew each other as well as two men probably could at the time. Their bond was more than mere uncle and nephew. It was a, it was a real brotherhood of trust and loyalty. I think this suggests that Thomas Beaufort must have been a moral man. Uh, he was certainly devout and conscientious and courageous, as we've seen. And I'm guessing Henry V believed that this man was the right man to raise Henry VI. Now, the problem was that Henry, Thomas Beaufort also did not live to see Henry VI take over the crown for himself. Um, disastrously, as it turned out, um, because in December 1426, after a lifetime of, you know, gruelling service uh, to three Lancastrian kings in a row, Thomas Beaufort died at his manor of Greenwich. Um, he had certainly been, you know, brave in war um, and pious by nature, and despite his, his, uh, his last you know, his last will, where he stipulated he wanted to waste no expense on a funeral, they gave him a, a large-scale state funeral at Westminster Abbey. You know, this was the least that Thomas Beaufort deserved. And he was buried then in Edmund, uh, buried at Edmunds, uh, interred next to his wife, who had predeceased him by about a decade. Now, that's Thomas Beaufort's, you know, war accomplishments, and that was what set him apart, uh, even in a time of almost continuous war. But the reason that I feel that Thomas Beaufort stands above other men who did have similar accomplishments at the time is that we know that he was uh, kind and charitable to those less fortunate. For we have the words of, of a contemporary chronicler called William, uh, William Worcester, who recounted how Thomas fed every day 13 poor people. And he always gave them two courses of food um, and also money. He also arranged via his cooks um, to provide 26 gallons of stew. So I've just got my cat here uh, to provide 26 gallons of stew for the poor. Um, sometimes we are told even feeding up to 300 people a day. Uh, and every day he also made sure they all had wine. So I think, you know, we could all really do with a friend like Thomas Beaufort providing us food and wine every day. Um, we also know that he did provide um, wine and food to women in Sorry, again, that was my cat. Um, providing food and wine for all women lying in childbirth. And every, you know, on the eve of St. St. Mary's every year, uh, he would always make sure that he gave a set of bedclothes, um, he gave a set of pillows, and he gave a set of uh, blankets to any poor person who needed them. Most importantly, any person who fell on hard times in France who had been at war with him, he made sure that he provided food, uh, wine and candles for them. You know, he really wanted to make sure that he was taking care of everybody who needed it. Thomas Beaufort was, as I'm hoping you are now um, in agreement with me, a remarkable man who lived uh, an extraordinary life. And he certainly played an integral role in establishing the Lancaster dynasty on the throne of England. He did die childless um, 
and he, and he certainly died, I think, before his time. It would have been extraordinary to see what impact he could have made if he had lived longer and certainly managed to make it just about into the Wars of the Roses. How different would history have been if he had still been on the scene? Uh, a scholar, a soldier and a statesman, I think Thomas Beaufort was unquestionably one of the last great uh, figures of medieval England and somebody whose story really isn't mentioned as often as perhaps it should do. So that's just a, you know, a quickish. Uh, I said a few minutes, but it's about 20. Um, just going over the life and times of Thomas Beaufort. If you'd like to learn more uh, in much further detail, you can, of course, pick up a copy of my book, The House of Beaufort, where I do recount Thomas's story um, from start to end. Thank you very much.